Thank you. That was perfect. Um, you, you, you queued it up um, in just the way I'd, I'd hoped, which is um, I'm going to tell you a story of it's going to start with how did I get here, and then it's going to be where are we going, and where are we going together. Um, but you know what you what you mentioned, uh, Jim, about the convergence of these of these movements. I mean that is really um, that's the, that's the that's the main point. I mean I have no business being here were it not for the fact that the magnetic attraction of what you're doing pulled me in. Um, I'll tell you a story about how I kind of got into drones in general, but um, at the end you will see that. What we did with drones, which is what's happening with the Internet of Things and wearables and robotics and automotive, et cetera, all paths lead to the Linux Foundation. And we see that we are converging now between what we're doing with aerial robotics, embedded Linux, um, smartphone guts technologies, the kind of the core, the core uh, processor and you know, hardware stacks, and then other projects like the Open Source Robotics Foundation, uh, the Ross uh, project, we're all finding ourselves in the same place, and this is exactly the right moment. Where we're like, oh, wait, we're doing this? You're doing this? We could be doing this together, or maybe we could be using your stuff. Or we suddenly now have a level of abstraction that we can start to use existing code, find relationships, build bridges between communities, because the te underlying technology is matured enough to the point that we can actually see what it is we're doing. So with that note, I'm going to sort of disqualify myself entirely in, you know, from a technical perspective for being here by showing you how I got here. And it starts with um, this. Um, 2007, very important year, as I'll, as I'll explain in, in, in a moment. 2007, I'm the editor of Wired Magazine, and I have five kids. My wife and I are trained as scientists. I was a computational physicist, and she's a molecular biologist. And we're trying to get our kids interested in science and technology, and utterly failing, just complete zero, um, possibly because we're trying so hard. And, um, but as editor of Wired, we get the, I got these, like, you know, these cool things would come to the office for review all the time. And if you... Um, you could take them home on a Friday if you promised to review them over the weekend. So this one weekend, on a Friday, the uh, 2007, the new LEGO Mindstorms robotics kit, LEGO Mindstorms NXT comes in. It's a beta unit, so we're one of the first to use, and I was like, awesome, okay, we will play, we'll build a robot on Saturday. And then this radio control airplane came in as well, and I was like, and we'll fly a plane on Sunday. You know, one way or another, something's going to stick. So this is Erin, a nine, and she is going through the instructions to build the Tribot, which is the first project you do with LEGO Mindstorms. And this is her brother Daniel, who has now spent the morning programming and assembling it. And right after he pushes the button, it then does what it's intended to do, which is move very slowly to a wall, detect the wall, and then move slowly back. And the kids are like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> right? We've seen Transformers. <laughs> And they were you know, utterly disappointed, and I realized that Hollywood has basically ruined robotics for kids. You cannot compete with CG. Real robotics is hard. So I was like, okay, we got Sunday. So we're gonna take the airplane to the field, and we watch YouTube videos of acrobatics, and it was really cool, and we go to the field, and this is what happened. <laughs> um, and you know, once again, everything they suspected about my little you know, geeky Geek Dad projects. I actually started a whole site called geekdad.com specifically to come up with projects that were fun for adults and fun for kids. And this turned then into their assumption that everything I did with them was actually intended to be a blog post for Geek Dad, so they wouldn't do that anymore. And the fact that they end in failure only confirmed all of their suspicions. It was mortifying. I had to buy them ice cream. It was just a complete wreck of a weekend. And I thought to myself, how could that have gone better? Well, obviously, we needed a cooler robot and a better flying plane. So I thought, well, what if the robot flew the plane? You know, so I kind of went back home, went for a run, cooled down a little bit, came back and said, okay, one last thing. So I Google flying robot, and the first result is drone, and I Google drone, and the first result is autopilot, and I Google autopilot, and there's this like lot of math and Kalman filters, and so I stopped Googling. And I um, said, let's just do this. Apparently we need an autopilot, and so here it is. The world's first Lego autopilot, created by nine-year-old children and me on, a, on the dining room table. Um, we knew nothing except for the fact that it had something to do with sensors. It was an ARM processor. We probably had to actuate a, um, you know, a rudder, an aileron, or elevator, or something like that. Um, 
So I, I actually just took a picture of this and put it on, on, on Slashdot, which was a, a big thing then. And it kind of went viral, and, every, and I was like, oh, well, maybe I should actually you know, make this work. So we, we uh, put it, uh, extended it a little bit, wrote a little code, all written by nine-year-olds, put it in an airplane. Here's a very, a very sleepy, um, uh, I guess, 10-year-old now, who I'm showing in our work. Um, and uh, it worked, and well enough to sort of not totally crash, but we needed to go further. So I, 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 that next page of Googling that involved actual math, we actually read those pages, and this was the next version of the Lego Autopilot, and this one has a full, a full um, inertial measurement unit um, with gyros and accelerometers and magnetometers, and it didn't actually have a common filter, but it, had a, it was doing sensor fusion. And um, you know, it was just kind of copying code I found off the internet, and, and we put that in a plane, and that one actually really flew pretty well. And this plane is now in the Lego Museum in Billund, Denmark. It's the world's first Lego UAV. Um, interestingly, um, as, the, as we do this, we realize that autopilots um, are considered or regulated through export control as cruise missile controllers. And there's a, um, they're export, they're, you can't export them, and if you do export them, you need to fill out this long form showing who it's going to go to and whether there's going to be 24-hour closed, uh, closed, uh, closed circuit television monitoring of this at all times. Um, so basically what we did here, and we're now talking about a Lego, Mindstorm's toy autopilot, what we essentially did was weaponize Lego, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so, you know, any time, it's 2007, I've just weaponized Lego with my children around the dining room table, created a Lego drone, which is now in the Lego Museum, and this should not be possible. This should not have happened. And I got chills. And the last time I got chills is the first time I used the web. You know, every now and then, the future just kind of sneaks up on you and you're like, something has changed. There's been a glitch in the matrix that allowed me to do this. I don't know what it is, but I don't get this. I mean, I was the editor of Wired. I saw a lot of technology. Very hard to blow my mind. And when I did something that I should not have been able to do, it blew my mind. And I, it wasn't like, I, it wasn't like you know, I discovered a genius in, within me. It's like something around me some enabling technology had showed up on my desk that allowed me to do something extraordinary. But I didn't really know what that enabling technology was. It was Lego Mindstorm, but clearly that was not the enabling technology. It must be something bigger. So I set up a community, which is, I do, called DIY Drones. Um, and it was really designed to do two things. It was designed to ask, for me to ask dumb questions in public and hopefully for other people to ask, answer my dumb questions. What it actually did um, in 2007, and this be, and this, and this, in a second I'll tell you, this turned out to be the key year. What it did is, it, is it, it surfaced the fact that everybody who was paying attention was asking the same question. Something, there's been a glitch in the matrix, something in, the no, in, in hardware has changed. Now, this is, what had, this is what it was. 2007 was the year of um, 3D printing, the, the RepRap open source project came out. It was the year of Arduino, the open source computing project. It was the year of the Make, uh, Make Magazine, the Maker Fair. It was the year that Lego Mindstorms came out. It was a year that the Wii controller, the, Wii, the Nintendo Wii controller came out. And so when you look at, we look at all of the hardware renaissance you're seeing right, right now, everybody who's, who's leading that sort of woke up that year and said, hardware starting, is starting to look like software. I can actually do cool things. And in the same sense that you know, Steve Jobs and Wozniak and the Homebrew Computing Club were basically liberated by the existence of, I think it was the Intel 8080 chip, or it was maybe one of the early Zilog chips, but basically it was a chip that a regular person could buy that could drive a computer. And just the fact that they could buy a chip liberated their, the notion they could build a computer, and then a company, and then an industry. And the same thing happened to us. When you got that Wii controller in your hand and you moved it, you could saw, a cur saw a cursor moving, you knew the inside was a sensor, and that sensor probably cost a couple cents. It's actually an accelerometer. And if you got a Lego Mindstorms that and it came with sensors, and you could just plug them in and you could measure the world. Or if you, got, if you downloaded some, you know, some plans off the internet and built a 3D printer and manufactured something on your desktop. Or if you got an Arduino and just got an LED to light, you know, without having to run a huge tool chain, that was the same moment that everybody around the world was having. And, then, and the question was, this, these technologies are available to us. What am I going to do with it? And a lot of people came to the notion of robotics and flying robotics in particular. And this was an industry 
that had been dominated by the aerospace business, by the military industrial complex, by, you know, by, by, by you know, military drones. And the notion, in the same sense that Jobs and Wozniak looked at the mainframe and made, and made a much worse computer, but one that anybody could use, we saw an opportunity to kind of come at the aerospace industry from a bottoms up homebrew computing club grassroots perspective, rather than inheriting the, you know, the business models and the regulatory models and the corporate models of the existing aerospace industry. So we, we, we saw that, that, that the stuff that used to be hard had suddenly got easy, stuff that used to be closed was getting open, and that we could start to leverage things like the Arduino project to very quickly come up to speed on everything we needed to do this stack of hardware and software and AI and, and, and aerodynamics. And so this community took off. The community started, um, started um, uh, creating code and hardware designs really quickly. And it was all basically driven by the economies of scale of smartphones. What's going on, the Moore's Law is moving faster today in our pockets than it ever has in history in any sector. And it's the combination of the MEM sensors, what's going on with the ARM core processors, the GPS modules, the camera modules, the wireless, all these things, the Apples and the Googles and the Samsungs and the LGs, they are driving down the price of these enabling technologies so quickly that they're transforming adjacent industries. And so when you look at why there's a, ha why there's a hardware renaissance, it's partly the open innovation model that we, that we adopted from the web and partially the availability of these enabling technologies, these components that spin out of smartphones, the smartphone industry, and are starting to change everything around it. This is the Internet of Things, it's automotive, it's wearables, it's robotics, it's smart homes. Everything is starting to look like a smartphone, just in a different configuration. And, and that's why we're starting to see this convergence of these, of these various industries. So when I talk about you know, robotics being the, um, the peace dividend of the smartphone wars, that's just one of many. Um, we are seeing we are seeing, you know, Jim talks about the golden age of open source, but we're actually seeing a golden age of hardware as well. And this hardware is, is, is moving in an open source direction because it stems from the same roots, the internet plus smartphones. So this, was, this, was, this is what this community taught me, that this is what's going on. It's an extraordinary moment. We can reinvent the aerospace industry. We can reinvent robotics. We can do it in an open community collaborative fashion. And there's only one thing that could possibly go wrong which is that people would actually want to buy these rather than make them themselves. So we were all hackers. We we're very comfortable with soldering and tool chains and compilers, et cetera. And then the next generation of people come along. And they say, that's awesome, but I would rather not solder. I'd rather not compile. Can I just buy one? And we're like, oh, I guess we have to start a company. Um, so here it is, our first production line. Um, this is, um, we're making Blimpduino, our robotic uh, autonomous blimp. Um, when I say we, I mean uh, three of the children were shanghaied into, into the, um, pr uh, you know, the, the production line. We pay them in strawberries and juice. Um, and uh, important lesson, do not put the six-year-old on quality control. <laughs> she doesn't do a good job, and the customers are remarkably unsympathetic. Um, this is the product we made. Those are, in fact, pizza boxes. Um, and um, we learned an important lesson about, about small business and manufacturing, which is to say that um, the worst thing that can happen is that people want what you make, because then you have to make it again. Um, so these sold out in 10 minutes, and I could not get the kids to come back around the dining room table. There was no amount of strawberries or juice that would, uh, would get them back on that table. So I needed to... Um, Expand. <laughs> um, so um, I, uh, I thought, well, I'll go to the community. And the smartest guy in the community by far in that time was a guy named Jordi Munoz, who was um, flying a, um, a helicopter with a Wii controller using Arduinos in the interface. And he was the one who was teaching us about common filters and hardware and software. And he was documenting everything. And it was amazing. So I just, um, I just pinged him. I never met him, but I pinged him. And I said, Jordi, you know, um, uh, let's start a company together. Um, I'll, uh, I'll write a check for, I think it was, I think maybe it was like $1,000 uh, for parts, and then you can do the soldering. And uh, he said, um, okay, well, you know, I'm not, not, not real busy right now, so I'll happily do it. Uh, so here is uh, Jordy, um, and this is our second production line. That's him hand soldering on the uh, dining room table. And I was like, okay, I will run the community, you run the factory. 
Um, and I thought that was the end of it. We're basically just trying to barely, you know, just to give the noob something in a box. And what's in a box was a bag with a board in it. They had to, you know, do all the through hole soldering. They still had to do compiling, et cetera. And I thought that was the end of it. I've got a day job. I'm busy. Um, and, and then Jordy kept sending me these photos. He said, um, Okay, um, it's 2010 now, and he says, I've moved to a, a proper space, and I've, I've, I've got some of my high school friends uh, to help, um, and I thought, I'm not sure why he's doing that, actually, um, and I thought to myself, my goodness, they've got shelves. That is so pro. <laughs> and then he sends me another picture, and uh, he says, um, I bought some pick-and-place machines from eBay, some used ones, and downloaded the manuals off the internet and taught myself how to use them, and stencil printers and reflow ovens and CNC machines, and I'm like, you can buy used pick and place machines on eBay? I, who knew? Um, and at this point, I thought it was kind of important that I actually meet him for the first time. <laughs> um, so, so, so we met. Uh, it turned out that when we met, Jordy was a, um, a, a teenager in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, he just graduated from high school, um, had not been to college. And um, you might think that when the editor of Wired decides to start a 21st century aerospace company with somebody, they probably would not pick a Tijuana teenager they met on the internet. And yet, in fact, that turned out to be exactly the right person for three reasons. Um, as you'll see in the in, in, in slides, first of all, Jordy, um, as, uh, Jordy was the, the, he's the web generation, he's the Arduino generation. He understood open innovation on a really kind of core, kind of almost animal level. He, 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 he just grew up in a world of infinite access to you know, information and to other people. He was naturally collaborative. He naturally posted his code and his videos on YouTube. You know, he, it didn't matter where he lived. It didn't matter where they went to school. He, he, was, he, was, he was born into open source. Secondly, because he was 19, he was totally fearless. He did not know that you're not supposed to, you know, start manufacturing companies by buying stuff on eBay and just doing it. Um, he didn't know you're supposed to go to college and do this stuff. He didn't know that, you know, you're supposed to have letters of credit and, you know, proper, proper, you know, corporate articles of incorporation. He just did it. And the third thing is that because he was in Tijuana, which is the capital of North American electronics manufacturing. This is just in the air, it's in the water. This is what people do. Building factories is what people do in Tijuana, and it seemed like the most natural thing in the world to just build a factory. Now, this one happened to be right across the border in San Diego, um, but uh, it was the same people. These kids all came from Tijuana. They all went to, to high school together. You know, the electronics was just the easiest thing in the world for them. So, you know, interesting, I could have picked a PhD from Stanford, and they would ha not have ever seen a factory. But by picking a Tijuana teenager, the notion of bridging the world from software to hardware was second nature. So he sends me more pictures. He says, I've opened the second plant now in Tijuana. This is the clean room facility. And I thought to myself, they've got smocks with our logo on them. It's really funny, as that woman there is wearing, is wearing the smock with the, with the logo. Uh, she's also, uh, um, she's got an electrostatic discharge um, cable. Um, this is an electrical cable that attaches to the device to avoid sparks. And some people saw this picture and they're like, you chain your workers to the machine? <laughs> So then he sends me, uh, this is another picture, uh, like, let me go back one, one uh, yeah, this is another picture of now, this is the outside of the facility um, in Tijuana taken from a drone. Now it's upgraded the facility, um, and at this point, um, now it's a proper, you know, it's, it's a big electronics manufacturing center. At this point, I decided it was time to quit my job. Um, that I don't know what had happened here, but it was amazing. Um, my co-founder had basically de-risked, grown, proven the market. He's like, shows me the books, we're doing $5 million in revenues. And you know, this is still, it's still, we haven't even like properly registered the company yet. Um, so um, I quit my uh, venture capital round and um, we you know, reformed the company uh, to do it properly. And you know, today this is, uh, that's our San Diego facility, it's our Austin, Texas facility, our Berkeley facility. Our, um, we now have uh, factories in Shenzhen. We've got um, uh, a, a, a much bigger um, facility now in Tijuana. And um, we are America's largest drone manufacturer. Two years after the dining room table with my children, we are now making more drones than all of the aerospace companies in America combined. Now our drones are cheaper. This is what they look like. <laughs> this is this is uh, this is one of our drones. This is an uh, Iris. Costs 750 bucks. Um, but you know, to be honest, this is what people want. Um, 
And uh, this is exactly what open innovation entails, that you're allowed, you can, you know, you can build a community, you can work collectively, you can, you can, you know, you can use the energy of, you know, an unbounded set of talents and, and, and experience out there to do things together that no one company could do on their own. Um, so, you know, these are the things that we make, autopilots, you know, various, various drones of various sorts, fixed wing, multi-copters, um, we, are, um, a, we are software and we are hardware, we're a company and we're a community. Um, and, uh, you know, the big transition for us is now formalizing much, in the same way we formalize the company, we're now formalizing the community. And uh, we're uh, thrilled now to be working within the uh, Lynx Foundation as the Drone Code um, Foundation. Um, and these are just some of the members. Um, we started uh, um, late last year and we're going to be ramping it up dramatically this year. Um, but what's it, what I love about this is that it's, you know, it includes Intel and Qualcomm and Box and Baidu and, you know, and, and lots of others. And this, there's a sense that drones are not just drones anymore. That drones are sensors in the sky. That drones are big data. That drones are a way to digitize the world. That drones are a way to extend the internet you know, out into the skies which are empty, by the way, because, because it's too expensive or too risky to put people up there most of the time. Um, and so this ability now to, to join up with these other open innovation movements is how we're going to you know, beat, I mean, the aerospace industry is no longer an issue here, but now we have huge Chinese competitors. We're the Android in our industry, but there's an Apple in our industry as well, uh, called DJI out of China. Uh, they're 20 times our size, multi-billion dollar company. You know, we need to compete with a 21st century Chinese company. Um, and, we do, and we're not gonna do it by raising more money than them or being smarter than them or faster than them. We're gonna do it by being more open than them. And that's what we have an opportunity to do, not just for us, but all the other companies that are members of the foundation. Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm running slightly out of time, but I just wanna show you a little bit what you can do with a, with a drone. This is just an example of how you take pictures around a, um, of any space, and then you can turn those pictures into a 3D model um, by using cloud, um, cloud uh, services. Um, that's, this is just a GoPro, um, and yet, and this is 3D scanning, but it would be impossible to do on the ground, and impossible to do with a manned aircraft, and impossible to do from a satellite, but it's super easy to do with a drone. And this is just the beginnings of it. We're getting much, much better at it now. Um, I wanted to uh, show you just a couple more slides um, about that. This is, um, this is an example of uh, what, let me see if I can move forward. This is the fries down in San Jose. Let me see if I can actually just start the video. This is now, once, once the resolution gets better, this is just a GoPro and one of our drones automatically circling around this, this, this vehicle. And within a few minutes, well, actually in this case it was a few hours, you're able to create this kind of photorealistic 3D imagery. Here's the same thing for a structure, for any of you who work at Google, you'll know this structure right across the, uh, right in the park, right across the way. That's just a GoPro scanned, scanning with a drone. Um, this is the, uh, the cement plant across the way from us as well. Um, this is like the first minute of the day. When we talk about why drones matter, the ability to digitize the physical world, this is, this is like the biggest big data opportunity I've ever seen. Um, we, we started by with these automated patterns. You touch a building and it goes out, the drone goes out and does the circles and then does the crosshatch pattern and gets all the imagery. But that's, that's only good for really simple buildings when you're pretty high. But what if you want to get really close? So the analogy we're using here with drones is if any of you have this app, a 123D catch from Autodesk on your phone, it's a way to do 3D scanning on your phone. And what you do is you just call up the app and um, you uh, take pictures of an object, you just walk around, and as you walk around, it asks you to take this picture, and then this picture, and that picture, and this picture, et cetera, and, and you fill out those two circles. Well, what we do for the real world, for physical stuff, is that we do a human-robot interaction, whereas you walk around the object. You're the lower circle here, and the drone is the upper circle, and the drone follows you using GPS follow-me functions, and all you do is your body is the controller. You walk around ensuring that there's no telephone lines or trees or cement trucks around. Your job is just to walk around the building. The drone follows you, goes up and down, scanning and taking pictures of the object, talking directly to the cloud via our, our APIs, and making sure it has exactly the right photos 
from the right perspective so you get the perfect scan as quickly and as reliably as possible. This, 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 is what, this is what autonomy brings you. This is what drones are. They're autonomous. You don't fly them. They fly themselves. Instead, they're just sensors in the sky. They're increasingly connected, talk directly to the cloud. Your phone is, we, because of our, uh, our way that our platform works, we can actually do computation on the vehicle, on your phone, or on the cloud, or all simultaneously. We can do that. We can load balance 1,000 hertz in the, on the vehicle, 10 hertz on the, on the, on the phone, and 1 hertz in the cloud. We, can ba we have in access to essentially unlimited computational resources. We, um, the, uh, everything's connected, and we can do all these tasks in parallel to, and not only with one drone, with maybe many drones. So now you start to see this cloud of sensors out there that are not one pilot, one drone, or one pilot at all. These are all autonomous sensors, like Google does Street View, we do Sky View, but it doesn't involve drivers. So the platform has been adopted uh, hugely. We're the leading um, uh, open UAV platform in the world. All the Chinese companies outside of DJI are using um, this platform. All the agricultural drones companies are using the platform. All those Kickstarter projects you've, you've seen with drones are using the platform. Um, you know, Google's using the platform with their drone efforts. Amazon's using the platform with their drone efforts. Um, this is, you know, this is exactly what we've tried to do, which is get the adoption, get that ability for everyone to experiment in different form factors and price points and markets and industry verticals, do more to collectively than any one company can do on their own. I have another drone here. Um, we don't make this drone. This is made by a Chinese company called Walkera. What I love about this drone, which by the way uses our software, is that I had no idea that it used our software. It just sort of showed up one day and it's, um, it's great. And it's cheap, and it's very effective, and it uses our software. And they didn't have to ask our permission. We didn't have to do a biz dev deal. Um, they, this is the marketplace at work. The marketplace shows our platform, and they're innovating in ways that we don't have to, or maybe even couldn't. And, so, and this is true for the small and the large and the pro and the consumer. And in the same way that Android won, by making it easy for other companies to innovate in both hardware and software, we're winning by doing the same thing with drones. And everyone says, what, you give away your IP to let the Chinese compete with you? And I'm like, absolutely. I mean, first of all, um, this is great for consumers. More vehicles, you know, more, more kinds of drones at cheaper prices, more competition. Second of all, they joined the Drone Code Foundation. They don't pay us anything, they pay the foundation. And they're going to be giving back to the community, whether they give back in engineering time, whether they give back in money, whether they give back in just collective marketing and support and more, more gathering of volunteers. We're creating a platform, a, a architecture of participation that encourages them to give back. And they start by using it, but it's our job, both within the foundation as a company, to encourage them to understand they're part of something bigger. They're part of a movement. And we need to make it easy for them to participate. Um, I'm just going to end really quickly with kind of the big picture. Where does that take us? And I think what we're seeing now is, is really a kind of a century-long view of the arc of history. The 20th century was company versus company. They owned the means of production. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you had a company, you had access to market. If you didn't have a company, you didn't. And those companies had factories, et cetera. Then it was product versus product. Many of the means production became available to all, contract manufacturing, outsourcing, things like that. But then, you know, but, but it was product versus product in the marketplace. And now I think we're moving towards an era of, of platforms, of ecosystem versus ecosystem. And the biggest platform wins. Everyone has access to hardware. Everyone has access to software. But people and this, you know, the social dynamics that create a true ecosystem, that becomes the competitive advantage and, in some senses, the barrier to entry to competitors. And those who get that, those who understand open innovation, are going to win. I don't have to tell you about the open innovation advantages, but in the case of hardware in particular, we are exempted from many hard, um, regulatory barriers. Things like um, export control are changed when you're, when you're open source. Things like, you know, um, um, liability are changed when you give away the product. Um, we, uh, our customers become our uh, in many sense, are beta testers, um, not because we necessarily ship bad, bad products, but because they're really encouraged to participate in enhancing those 
those, uh, those, those products. Our products get better every day because they're connected, because they have the feedback from our customers. Um, so the rest of this will be, will be completely natural to you, but I just wanted to end with this last slide that shows you exactly how our architecture of participation works. You will laugh because we're not, you know, we're by no means the most sophisticated out there, but you know, this was a big, big step for us as we moved up the, uh, move from informal to, to more, more specific. Um, we, we started by saying, hey, thank you for your commit. We'd like to give you a, a t-shirt, just a recognition. Um, next, we'd like to give you a hardware discount. Um, that's actually, you know, it, again, these, these people have day jobs. Many of them work for Apple or for Google or for Microsoft. They don't need the money. They don't need the t-shirt. They don't even need the coffee mug. Um, they don't need the hardware discount, but they really appreciate it because, they, because it's the recognition that what they do matters. Um, they get free hardware. Sometimes at a certain point, that actually starts to matter. Um, then they get a trip to the uh, dev meeting, um, and we now have two. Uh, one, one's going to be the, at the ELC later on um, this year in San Jose, and then DroneCon, which is our, our own conference at the end of the year. And then this is where it gets kind of interesting. At the end of the process, when they've really shown their worth, we hire them, or give them equity, or both. Almost all of our, of our, our top leaders in our, in our um, we're now 300 people, um, but almost all of the leaders in our dev teams um, and, our, and our internal engineering teams came out of the community. We don't, we don't even look at the resumes. We don't care what they've done, where they've been, all we can, where, what school they went to. All we care is what can they do for us? What have they done for us? And if they don't want to join us, we still give them equity in the company. They get options or grants. Um, this, a, this was tricky to handle legally, um, but it was the right thing to do, and um, we're proud that we've been able to industrialize the open innovation model like so many before us. Um, thank you for the Linux Foundation for helping us do this, and we're thrilled about what's next. Thank you very much.